All right, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to our Climate Career Week panel focusing on mechanical engineering careers in climate. Uh, my name is Twish Mehta. I am a mechanical engineer myself and also the Senior Director of Engineering and Enterprise Decarbonization at Loblaw Companies Limited. I'm also a member of ASME's inaugural Committee on Sustainability to advance ASME's response to climate change. On behalf of ASME and Engineering for Change, we want to thank our partners at Climate Draft for their commitment and results that they bring to the task of building our climate workforce. Climate Draft is a network of more than 600 venture-backed climate tech startups working together to mobilize talent to work on climate solutions. They offer programming, resources, networking opportunities to draft the world's best talent to apply their skills developing and deploying decarbonized technologies of the future. While it may seem, seem obvious to some of you why ASME wants to grow the pipeline of mechanical engineers in the climate tech sector, allow me to quickly to share a little bit about ASME for those of you who don't know us. The American Society of Mechanical Engineers is a nonprofit, member-focused engineering society with 78,000 members in 135 countries. We're also a global standards developer, a research and development organization, a convener, and a provider of training and education. We're proud to set the standard, quite literally, in industries from nuclear fission to submarines. We both directly invest and accelerate emerging climate technologies through our accelerator, iShow, and have been supporting global cohorts of hard tech social ventures for almost a decade with programming that is considerate of the complexity of scaling startups in frontier markets. We also spend a lot of time on education and workforce development. This is core to our mission, which is to enable collaboration, knowledge sharing, career enrichment, and skills development across all engineering disciplines. We have always supported sustainable development, but formalized this in 2009 with the establishment of our leading platform, Engineering for Change, or E4C. E4C is a global nonprofit dedicated to preparing, educating, and activating the global technical workforce to improve the quality of life of people and the planet. It reaches more than a million STEM practitioners globally with insights, programs, and opportunities to advance sustainability locally and globally. The bottom line is ASME has always been committed to leveraging engineering and technology to provide innovative solutions to the world's most challenging problems. Climate change stands as one of those defining challenges. Our vision for a sustainable workforce powered by clean energy relies heavily on a robust and skilled workforce. However, there is a growing gap between this vision and the availability of engineers and technical professions equipped to make it a reality. 30% of the listings on the Climate Draft job board have mechanical engineer in the job description. As companies continue to scale across a variety of climate solutions, there will be an even greater need for mechanical engineers to apply their skills towards climate solutions. This session will shed a, shed a little bit of light on the climate tech startups and the mechanical engineers who work there. I'm very excited to learn about the journeys that our panelists have taken to reach their current positions and what the work they are working on right now is. I'm certain we're all gonna be inspired by their insights. Once again, thank you for joining us today for your commitment to addressing the climate challenge and for your dedication to making our world a better place. As we get into the panelist session, if you have any questions during the session, please use the Q&A button in your Zoom window to ask your question. And when it comes time for question and answer, we will certainly address it. So now I'd like to introduce all of our panelists. Our first panelist is Mazar Mirza, uh, Vehicle Architecture Lead from River. Mazar, can you uh, uh, introduce yourself a little bit, please? Uh, hello, so myself, I am Mazar Mirza. So I work at an organization called River. So we make electric two-wheelers. Uh, uh, so our motto of organization is to provide uh, electric two-wheeler mobility solutions, which will also empower people to earn their livelihood aspects as India being one of the country which is heavily dependent on two-wheeler mobility solutions. So we have chosen a path to decarbonize the tail pipe emissions that are happening in this sector. So my responsibility at River is basically to work on mechanical systems ranging from durability, reliability aspects, vehicle simulations, uh, anything that has to do with the mechanical systems and system engineers. Great, welcome, Mazar. We really appreciate it. Our next panelist is Duncan Karayuki. He's a product lead at Octavia Carbon. Duncan, welcome. 
Hey everyone, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening where you are. Uh, my name is Duncan Karioki. I am the product lead at Octavia Carbon. At Octavia, we basically develop a technology that filters CO2 from the air. It's called direct air capture. Uh, and we uh, add a secret source, or at least uh, we combine it with geothermal to uh, essentially drive it down its cost. Uh, at Octavia, my role is basically leading on the engineering designs of the reactors that we build and also uh, working on the plant that we, we're building. So we essentially link up uh, multiple modular reactors uh, in a plant, combine it with geothermal and essentially pump CO2 deep underground where it will cease to uh, cause negative effects uh, to the climate. That's amazing, Duncan, thank you. Uh, our next panelist is Melissa Mansour. She's a senior mechanical engineer at Electra. Melissa, welcome. Hello, um, I'm Melissa Mansour, and I'm coming to you from Boulder, Colorado at Electra. Um, at Electra, we're working on decarbonizing the steel industry. Um, so as a, per, as a process, steel production is responsible for 10% of CO2 emissions, and 90% of those emissions are realized in the primary iron um, step of the process, which is run at about 1600C. Here at Electra, we've developed an alternate process that runs at only 60 C, um, can employ intermittent power, so it's um, renewable grid friendly and can um, and it can utilize already mined um, low um, value ores. So those are really important because um, those ores have already had the carbon capital spent on them to pull them out of the ground, but they can't be utilized by traditional processes because they're not pure enough but our process can utilize them. Um, so um, yeah, I'm here as a senior mechanical engineer and I'm responsible for just a lot of the general design, structural design, thermal calculations, electrical design, and I'm building some of that. So thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us, Melissa, thank you. And last but not least, we have uh, Annie Ning. Annie is the manager of mechanical engineering at Antora Energy. Annie, if you can introduce yourself, welcome. Yeah, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Annie. Uh, I'm here in San Jose, California at Antora Energy. Um, at a really high level, Antora Energy is focused on decarbonizing heavy industry, uh, which currently generates about 30% of our total global carbon emissions. Uh, we consider the entire solution space for this problem over a couple of years of research and uh, landed on this modular uh, thermal energy storage system as the most cost-effective and scalable way to tackle um, that particular chunk of global emissions. Um, industrial facilities require constant heat and electricity for their processes, you know, 24-7, uh, 365 days a year, and so we can't necessarily um, directly plug into a, a variable renewable source. Um, so our thermal batteries will sit in between uh, the industrial plant and a renewable energy source. Uh, it'll charge up when the cost of electricity is cheap um, by resistively heating a stack of very dense carbon blocks, um, it'll store that heat in our insulated module, and then it'll discharge that energy on demand um, via radiation to generate steam for our customer. Um, so our first installations will be focused on just heat uh, via steam as a primary output, but in the future, our thermal batteries will also be modified to include a thermophotovoltaic panel, um, which is a lot like a solar panel, um, to directly convert some of that radiation into electricity. Uh, so that'll allow us to tackle both the heat and the electricity part of the puzzle uh, simultaneously in the same kind of modular unit. Um, so as the uh, manager of mechanical engineering here, I'm responsible for, my team is responsible for designing that, that whole uh, modular system. Um, there's a lot of interesting thermal structural problems with graphite blocks getting to 2000 Celsius. Uh, we have a lot of fluid and gas systems. Um, and yeah, we'll start to crank out some of those boxes in our uh, pilot facility here in, in the next year or so. Um, so yeah, excited to be here. That that sounds very exciting, Andy. Thank you for joining us. Um, let's get into the panel uh, panelist session now. Um, I I want to start off kind of we have a we have a wide diverse audience of of uh, relatively young uh, mechanical engineers who are coming out of school, perhaps still in school in university and college, uh, and then we have some folks who who have been transitioning throughout their careers. Um, Andy, I want to go back. To, I want to go back to you first. How are you, you, you and your team, I guess, kind of applying the skills that you develop in mechanical engineering throughout your career, throughout one's career um, in, into this space, in, in your job? Yeah, I, I mean, I'd say it's the same skills as any other mechanical engineering role, whether it's in climate or, or otherwise. Um, you know, we're using first principles like textbook equations uh, and also test data um, to design and, and test and build this first of the kind uh, thermal mechanical system. Um, so my team specifically is doing a lot of the like, 
you know, spreadsheet, thermo, uh, techno-economics work, um, architecting, and, and then also uh, producing detailed designs, you know, CAD and drawings, GDNT, um, for like structural steel components, there's some graphite components, you got heat exchangers, um, high voltage, low voltage, electrical systems, etc. Um, I still have a copy of, you know, my Shigley's engineering textbook at my desk and, you know, Bickford's Bolt textbook that I crack open, you know, all the time to run beam bending equations for like initial sizing of components uh, all the time. Um, prior to Intora, I was at SpaceX for several years and um, it's honestly a, a pretty similar challenge as designing the rocket, a slightly different scale of, of complexity, but um, really the, the main difference that I've seen so far is that by the time I arrived at SpaceX, it was a pretty um, well-established company. Um, so a lot of those processes, software like calculators, uh, we're all well established and, and well built, and and right now, it, since Intor is a relatively early startup, um, I'm having to start from scratch and building those things here. But uh, otherwise, a, a lot of the same skills are being used. Awesome, Mazar. How about you? Um, what about in your in your realm in the vehicle space? Uh, yeah. So as Annie was saying, we we also stick with uh, fundamentals, and so whether it is uh, uh, an IC based uh, two wheeler or is is it an EV based tool, except from your energy train, uh, everything falls to be the same. So what we have done is uh, we, uh, uh, we have focused more on systems engineering aspects where, where the block was missing when you do a transition from an uh, different energy sector to an uh, electric space when the form is still the same, right? So, so we tried connecting the system engineering dots, whether it is an a thermal aspect of an EV or you say low voltage, high voltage system, how do you, how do you connect all these blocks with respect to your uh, durability aspects or what are the different other attributes of the vehicle out there? So we stick with the fundamentals are still the same. How you connect these fundamentals to form a building block is something different from the other IC sector. So that is the block that we generally focus on. And yeah, all other fundamentals remains the same. And so this journey, I was doing at other two startups before in India, which were again into electric two-wheeler space. So this was my third startup in EV two-wheeler in India. The other two wheelers, the other two startups are going to IPO this year. So yeah, so for me, this journey is happening from last eight years in EV two-wheeler space. It's mature industry, as you speak. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one thing that both Andy and Mazar alluded to that I'd like Melissa to kind of jump in on is it seems like the space, because it's it's growing, it's relatively new, um, it seems like it's more than just mechanical engineering skills that, that we're bringing to the table. We're really integrating. Melissa, maybe you can speak to a little bit about that. Um, what kind of skills in the engineering realm that are beyond mechanical, um, that maybe a mechanical engineer might develop um, are useful here in your career? Yeah, so I think that um, the background that we all have in mechanical engineering is fairly wide ranging. Like I mentioned before, um, I'm doing anything from structural to thermal to electrical calculations. And I think having a background in mechanical engineering helps you put that all together. So I think it's more um, having kind of a larger bird's eye view of each of these integrated systems and being able to put them together is really key in pushing any of these technologies forward. Hey, Twitch, I think we lost your audio. Of course, it's my audio. I thought it was someone else's audio. <laughs> um, actually, Mazar, I was, I was, uh, I was actually asking. Uh, yeah. You've, you've done a couple of startups now, three, I think. Yes. I think you're on your third. Yes. Can you yes. talk a little bit about the day in the life of you as an entrepreneur, especially an entrepreneur in the climate space? Uh, yeah, so so see the the day starts with uh, uh, so every day starts with a new problem statement being in a startup right so so uh, every day you go with the same passion and enthusiasm to your workspace thinking that okay there will be some a new challenge that comes in your everyday uh, everyday world so so it goes a quick catch up with the team a quick morning stand ups going through the calendars what all meetings are there and then understanding the bottlenecks that we have with respect to the current program quick catch up with the cross-functional teams, understanding what kind of solutions are required. 
and then go to an detailed catch up with uh, different functions that i will be having going through their uh, uh, problem statements helping them around looking into the test data or simulation data or looking into any control system frameworks that team has come up with and and the and the uh, complete day wraps up doing all these things and yeah if there is a particular problem statement that is a very complex thing yeah then the then the da doesn't close off right so generally you go home thinking that okay how to solve this uh, what kind of uh, uh, help is required if uh, do we need more time because you you are always on your toe in a startup to solve the things because the expectation to deliver things is higher and you always expect to deliver your result in a short span of time uh, so yeah so meeting the expectation giving the right solution so it is something exciting on a daily basis for me it must be an exciting day every single day for you duncan i'm going to bring you into this as well what does your day look like yeah um so i, I can split uh my three my day into uh, three functions uh, one is planning. Um, so I, I lead a team of around seven people uh, who also work across uh, different other teams. So um, within the product team uh, of our team, we work very closely with our R&D team who, who develop our, our technology and then also our, uh, our, manu uh, our manufacturing team. Uh, and so there's always a lot of planning around uh, syncing all these different functions. Uh, the other one is design, the actual design of the, of the reactors that we build. Uh, they, there's every everything um, from thermal designs, from structural designs, um, electrical instrumentation designs. And we do have folks who, who work on that within the team. Uh, and then the, the final thing is, uh, is now about implementation and a lot of experimentation. Early stage technology, you're developing things for the first time. Uh, sometimes they work, sometimes, most times they don't. Uh, so there's a lot of experimentation. Uh, and then just feeding that back into the design cycle to essentially improve our designs and mature it as fast as we can. Uh, so that's generally how, how my day is usually spread out. I, uh, as an early stage uh, startup, we also, uh, I'm also rooting a lot into our commercial side of things uh, because tech investors generally are, are quite tech savvy and they want to understand all the nitty gritties of uh, different aspects of our tech. And that just needs, it needs an engineer to be able to communicate it. So I support our commercial and our, uh, uh, and our, our commercial team and our CEO uh, on investor diligence and also uh, commercialization of our technology as well. Duncan, I'm curious uh, as a follow-up, how did you develop those skills to be able to not only be the technical voice to these uh, investors, but also understand the business side of things as a startup? Oh, uh, just through practice. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm quite lucky that uh, our CEO is a pretty good coach. Uh, so um, he gave me a lot of feedback very early on. Um, I've always loved the business side of things and understanding business models, uh, understanding how the mind of an investor because um, you know investors are, are the ones who are funding us right now. So being able to communicate our technology in a way that uh, makes it comfortable for them uh, and also um, communicate the vision in a way that gets them excited about what we're doing because it's a first of a kind in Africa and anywhere else in the global south. So uh, we have to also get people exi excited about that. So uh, I do have a really good coach in our CEO uh, who's helped me on that. Um, and then also getting a lot of feedback also from investors uh, is the same is the way I would say that I've learned just through implementation uh, and never done it before. I came, um, my only skill was design uh, when I started at Octavia, but uh, at least now through a lot of rigorous feedback I've gotten to where I am right now. That That's great. I think having that network, having that coach within your company or even outside, I think is, is incredibly useful and, and valuable. I, I'd encourage the entire audience to find a mentor like that for yourself. Annie, um, I want to kind of, piggyback off of what Duncan alluded to, but in a, a little bit of different light. Um, from a professional development standpoint, what's unique in climate tech that maybe you've embarked on in your career or what you've encouraged your team to pursue to become more well-versed in the skills that are needed in a climate tech, uh, climate tech type company? Mm, do you mean from a, like a technical perspective versus from a- Either, either. Um... 
I mean, I, I think I really do focus on just bringing the same engineering fundamentals to our day-to-day -day design work. Um, kind of like others mentioned before, maybe the, uh, I think the, the main difference for us is again, because we're such a uh, early stage startup and my team is relatively new. We're only about a year old. Um, again, like developing those uh, processes and, and infrastructure, um, that, that part is definitely a skill that uh, a lot of my teammates are, are excited to do, but maybe haven't had to do from previous larger companies in the past where things were better established, like, you know, how, how do you release a drawing or what safety factors do you use are all kind of dictated to you from up high. And um, at this point, we're still kind of figuring out, given our technology, it's it's sort of a, a new first of the kind design. Um, do, what, you know, codes do we need to be compliant to? We're, we're not super sure yet. We have some ideas. Um, ASME is one of them. So we're currently doing a lot of reading and chapter eight for, you know, uh, pressure vessels and, and 31.3. But um, having to figure out, you know, we're trying to move fast and um, design from first principles because we were, you know, we are uh, low on resources and, and can't spend, you know, five years uh, reading through all the code and becoming experts. But how do we uh, bring that approach and kind of meet in the middle uh, with, with being able to become code compliant in the future when we do understand what that landscape looks like from a, a permitting perspective and a, a financing perspective. Um, so it's a little bit of like, yeah, you know, the typical building the plane in the air while you're flying it. Uh, but also we're building the like wrenches and the nuts and the bolts to build the plane, you know, while yeah. also flying it. Um, so that part's been, I think, the most uh, fun challenge for us. Well, and, I mean, not to use ASME's tagline, but in a way you're also setting those standards as as someone participating mm -hmm. in the industry. So it, it's actually quite <laughs> exciting. Melissa, anything you want to add in terms of uh, kind of professional development opportunities that you, your team um, pursue to advance? Um, so I think that the best thing about our team is that we have a lot of autonomy. So if there's a piece of that puzzle that you want to put together, if you really want to dig into the codes and figure out what applies, or if you want to run with any of the part of the problem that we're trying to solve, um, it's it's open to you. So having that freedom and autonomy is really um, a major difference that I see from like maybe a more established place. Um, and I really appreciate that and have been able to capitalize and learn a lot um, just having that space and autonomy to do so. Perfect. Um, I'm going to go to Mazer now. This is somewhat of a, a different angle in terms of the questions that we're, we're going to take. Mazer, when you started in your first yeah. business, did you think that you, you are going to pursue a career that would be impactful to the world, impactful to society? How did you view that aspect? Uh, yeah, so so yeah, I, I always wanted to be in an organization where my role is bigger. Uh, I would always, uh, I always wanted to work on a problem statement, which is new. So during my uh, bachelor's program, so I used to be part of former student and Baha teams in, in my undergrad days. Then, then that, that was the a starting stepping stone to understand, uh, uh, okay, so these are the areas that has to be understood. So, so making making yourself work in a student team has helped me uh, uh, understand that okay, working on a bigger problem statement uh, gives you much of a job satisfaction rather than working on a very small uh, problem statement in a bigger MNC. So that's how I was looking into uh, uh, roles that that would generally excite me. Uh, immediately after my uh, bachelor's program, I have landed in. Uh, two often offers both in startups. One was into aerospace and one was into auto automotive field. And I have chosen automotive because it was back in uh, 14, uh, some 15 when this EV space in India was just growing up, I was just about to start. I thought, okay, this is the right time for me to uh, take this opportunity and move ahead. So yeah, that's how the journey has started. And meeting like-minded people who would like to work on a bigger picture rather than working on a very small problem statement. So yeah, that's how the journey has started. I, I want to ask the same question to all of our panelists because I think everyone's story is unique and, and interesting. So Duncan, how about yourself? Um, how did you kind of transition into, into the, the, whether it was a passion or of, of impacting the world or whether it was a passion for the technology? Um, talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. So, uh, yeah, uh, as you, as you can imagine, uh, climate change affects the global south a lot more vastly. Um, and so, I, I actually came. From, uh, my inspiration into getting into dark was 
inspired by the people I grew up with. So uh, my parents are farmers, the people around me are farmers. I grew up in central Kenya. Uh, and so uh, when I started uh, thinking or looking into that, it was in the midst of Kenya's longest drought. So I saw what it did to the folks around me. And so I want, I, I knew instantly that I wanted to work, uh, do something in climate. Uh, and you know, we've, we've talked about uh, solving the problem at, at its root cause. And for me, that was just pulling CO2 from the air. So uh, it was a natural fit to do to choose DAC because it, it ties very well in with uh, mechanical engineering. And it was the right mix of a really tough problem or a really tough and exciting engineering challenge which is something i wanted um and combines that with a really outsized impact if we get it right and so um i ended up uh, choosing this as uh, my career choice i actually didn't know that you could build a business out of it i was more fascinated with the technology thankfully martin uh, when uh, he's originally uh, austrian when he moved to kenya to start octavia um, he knew about building business more uh, business models and how to build a business out of it. So it was a natural fit there. Um, but yeah, really inspired by the folks that I grew up with. That's amazing. Melissa, how about you? Yeah, I would say that I definitely um, had some brushes or you know interest in climate work but um, i think i my most formative was probably an internship i did at the national renewable energy laboratory but i took a lot took a lot of twists and turns um, probably worked in at least five different industries before i finally got back to working in climate change and i think i just feel like um, having all those experiences um, just brought me to a place where i realized that um, it was good to have all those experiences so that i could apply them to the problem of climate change, because when you really look at it, some of the things we've already talked about today, we're all using the same skills that we use in any role or any schooling that we had and the ability to actually um, apply them to climate is um, really rewarding. So I finally got back to it. I'm glad to be here. Um, so. Great. And Annie, how about you? Yeah, I think similar to Duncan, I uh, kind of saw the effects of climate change early on in, in my life. So sort of knew I always wanted to do something in the environmental sustainability uh, world or climate tech world. Um, I, I grew up in Alaska. So, you know, we kind of saw a lot of the effects of, of global warming, um, you know, as early as like childhood for me. So I like polar bear habitats shrinking, like coastal communities being flooded out and having to move inland and all those things. Um, so, yeah, that's something that just had in the back of my head my entire life. Um, when I left college, uh, SpaceX was the company that gave me a job offer and, and I wanted to, um, you know, actually get real engineering skills. Um, so, you know, working in aerospace for uh, my first job out of college was a, a really like rigorous way to kind of learn, like, what does it really mean to be an engineer and, and design, um, you know, a system, um, whether it's like from scratch or, or iterating on something, um, you know, how to apply the, the classroom principles that I've been learning to like a real slightly unbounded uh, situation. And, and yeah, because it was so rigorous and involved a lot of um, you know, back and forth with like NASA and Space Force, uh, kind of learned to like really hone in on the like fundamentals to real life application. Um, and then, yeah, after SpaceX, I, I took several months off to sort of uh, recenter myself and figure out like, you know, what do I want to do? And I knew you'd be in somewhere in the climate space. So just spent a long time researching and um, talking to co-founders and looking at like what different solutions were, were out there in the world, like what was actually making a difference. Um, and then, yeah, landed on Intor from there. So really happy to kind of finally be aligning with my, my top level career goals. Wonderful. Um, Annie, I want to stick with you. I, I think a lot of our audience um, is probably contemplating a move towards the climate and climate tech space. Um, I'm curious, since you had that passion relatively early on, or at least you acknowledged the, the kind of the problem, um, how did you kind of educate yourself or how did you become your, how did you, how did you become comfortable with understanding the, the the science and the problem, or the, I shouldn't say problems, the challenges of climate? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, uh, I think I went through the same process starting at SpaceX. I certainly did not understand rockets or 
you know, orbital mechanics or how engines worked coming out of college. So it didn't feel particularly different from, from that. Um, it was a little bit of self-education, a little bit of like talking to people as well. Um, I was pretty fortunate to actually have like dedicated time off, like between jobs um, where, you know, I have a partner that was working uh, full time and, and uh, let me take as much time off as I needed to just sort of rest and recuperate and, and also do some research. So uh, for me personally, because I, I had that time, I was reading a lot of books. I was uh, listening to a lot of podcasts, um, you know, audio books and, and reading through websites just to like understand what is the, the general state of, you know, what are the, the various pieces of the, the pie that are contributing most to climate change? And then what are the different technologies uh, attacking each of those things? How viable are they? Like, do they actually close from a, an economic perspective or are they just sort of pie in the sky? Um, so it started with, you know, reading uh, Drawdown is a pretty popular, um, you know, good book that actually breaks out various technologies and, and you know, uh, policy approaches to solving the, the problem. Um, and, and then kind of from there honed it on what specific um, issues and technologies I was interested in. Um, and then at that point, I kind of looked through, you know, climate draft and, and climate base and various climate focused VC portfolios to see what companies were out there, like actually addressing those problems. Um, and then from there, either like cold called those those co-founders on LinkedIn and, and asked for, you know, just some, some time to ask questions uh, or listen to podcast interviews with them to understand, like, how did they approach uh, technology um, development and also like building a team, like what culture were they developing at their companies? Um, and, and yeah, just like that, that part of it was especially important to me to, to find a company that had a, a culture and, and values that really matched my own. Um, so yeah, all, all that, you know, took a, a fair bit of time and research on my part and um, definitely not going to be the case for everyone to, to have that much time. But um, even just like, you know, listening to, to podcasts or an audiobook during your commute uh, to and from work or on the weekends is a really good way to start getting educated. Um, it doesn't take a whole lot, um, but uh, it certainly is good to do your own due diligence and make sure that what you're jumping into is, is like a, a real feasible technology and not just sort of, uh, you know, snake oil. Um, but yeah, I don't think it takes a, a super long time and then um, really just like reach out through your network or through LinkedIn and just start like asking a bunch of questions. I thought that part was um, the, the most helpful. Yeah. And I think that could apply to really any any area that um, someone's excited in. I think I think those are great, great pieces of just career advice and career transition advice. Thanks, Annie. Duncan, I also want to give you an opportunity to respond to that, that question as well. Um, how did you kind of educate yourself in in the the science and the, and the nuances of of the climate challenge? Yeah, um, the, the easiest uh, or at least the short answer here is through a lot of failure. Uh, I mean, it's the scientific process. You you start with a hypothesis, uh, you design something, uh, and then. You, you build it and it fails. That, that's basically how at least I and most of us uh, got to where we are in terms of our knowledge about dark, because none of us had a background in uh, un uh, understanding uh, or at least building direct air capture reactors or machines uh, and even the plant. Uh, and uh, I'll give an example. So I'll, very early on, the dark process has a sec uh, has a step where you generate a vacuum. Uh, and if you're not built a vacuum system before, uh, it can be very easy to fail in them because you don't realize how high atmospheric pressure actually is. Uh, and we built the first two systems that had two different mechanisms for sealing off the unit from the atmosphere because we had a problem where in one cycle we needed to open ex uh, extremely, or at least fully open to the atmosphere to allow air in. And the other cycle step of the cycle, you needed fully sealed tight with no leaks whatsoever. Um, and when we started out early on, uh, we had no idea how to achieve these two conflicting goals. And we built two systems, none of them worked really well, but both of them taught us what not to do. Uh, and in the third system, we actually achieved our first vacuums, which was a pretty important uh, uh, a step in actually getting to a working dark machine. And it's something that I always reflect on. And it taught me that the, the best way to actually pick up scientific knowledge on something that uh, you have no background in is one uh, experiment. Start with a hypothesis, follow the scientific process, fail, um, have an intelligent failure, and then fit that back in. And there's a really good book on this uh, by Amy Edmondson uh, called uh, The Right Kind of Wrong, which talks about how to drive innovation rapidly. Uh, and then the second piece is just find experts in the space. And that's something that we've also learned. Um, so you can always break down 
one really complex system into a number of small systems where you, you know you'll have experts in heat transfer you'll have experts in vacuums you'll have experts in uh, airflow and you can consult all these experts in different and get uh, in in all these different aspects and get their uh, get their insights and even 30 minutes with an expert in a space gets you so much further than um than you would uh, using the brute force method as I, as I described earlier. So those are the two ways I would say that uh, we built the experience in building these reactors, failure and uh, consultation with experts in the space. Great, does anyone, Mazar or Melissa, do you wanna jump in on, on kind of what Duncan and Annie had alluded to? Uh, yeah, so uh, so being uh, uh, so with respect to myself working in different startups, so uh, it has given me an opportunity to uh, maneuver in multiple departments throughout my uh, years of uh, work experience in three different startups. I started my career with being a structural engineer. Then I have moved towards more into vehicle dynamics. Then then the opportunity is fed to him, and so you can work on widespread of. Uh, uh, problem statements then i figured out that okay i have understand the system so let me understand it in a better way then i opted for a masters did in did my masters in dynamics and controls so after i have understood the problem statement and how it can be stitched together and what is the drawback that i was having so once i am back with my masters then i again went back to the same industry where i knew that i would be able to add more value to it so that's when i did a transition of connecting back a mechanical systems to a control systems. So that's how I maneuvered back into batteries, understanding a control systems of a batteries or electric machines. So then my role was having, so it, it did a transition from a complete structural to a control system. So, so it's all about understanding a problem statement in the field you are at and understand uh, what you really want to be. And and uh, if required, if you're getting an enough exposure in your domain itself, stick with it. If not, if you clearly know that, okay, you want to be this, pursue a, a having uh, further academics in that and then go back to the same field and then further excel in that. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Melissa? So I think one thing that I really have um, appreciated um, working in a startup is coming um, to bring together a really diverse team. I think if you bring together people from a lot of different industries, you can also get outside ideas that you can apply that you didn't expect maybe to make some of those um, methods work. And so I think the diversity of your team is also really important. Okay. How about we talk a little bit about, about that in, in greater detail, Melissa. Talk to me about how diversity is important and and how should we as leaders within the climate space, whether in climate tech, like all of yourselves, myself in, in kind of the decarbonization space, how should we be looking at at kind of having a diverse workforce uh, to, to help us address these challenges? Yeah, so I think if you bring together a group like um, chemists, physicists, um, Duncan, people that have worked in ultra high vacuum, um, when you're applying that to um, a problem, I think you don't expect those people to be able to help, but the more diversity you can bring to the team, the more experiences people have had, maybe they've put together a vacuum system or done any of those things that you haven't done. It just really helps drive the team forward. And I think being open to other people's ideas and opinions, even if they're not necessarily an expert in that space, um, they definitely have always something to offer. So. And Annie, did you, I mean, you, you lead a relatively um, substantial team. How, how, how do you introduce diversity um, in, in various ways, I guess, including some of the ways that Melissa referenced in terms of uh, technical experience? How, how do you build out your team that way? Yeah, it's something that for me, I think has to be very intentional and doesn't just sort of happen by random chance. Uh, and, you know, I'm looking at diversity in, in multiple axes. That can be diversity of background, diversity of, you know, like race and gender and, and also like technical experience. Um, so, yeah, as a, as a hiring manager, uh, I've kind of noticed that if I were just to like uh, interview and hire people based on who like which resumes come to my desk first, it tends to be a fairly like monolithic sort of looking group of people. And uh, a lot of the work that I do as a uh, as a manager at this point is, is to do a lot of outreach and um, either going to like universities and, and job fairs uh, or reach out to people, just like cold calling them on LinkedIn and offering a few minutes to chat about the company. Um, 
it takes a lot of uh, pretty intentional outreach and uh, a fair bit more uh, boots on the ground work to, to make sure that I'm um, crafting a team that is, you know, well-rounded in, in skills and experience and, and industry and um, as, as well as, you know, identities. Um, I think uh, another important part of the diversity question isn't just bringing in a bunch of people that are diverse, but like really crafting an environment that's also inclusive and really fosters a sense of belonging and, and um, like psychological safety. Because um, just having the diversity aspect doesn't necessarily, you know, solve all your problems all at once. But um, what the psychological safety part of it does bring in is, is making everyone feel like they are allowed to fail and allowed to make mistakes or allowed to put out a crazy idea or take a risk. Um, and, and then move quickly, uh, which is what we're, what we're trying to do and, and learn quickly. Um, so that that's a second element that I think Antwerp does a really good job of implementing really from the, from the top down as a very deep, deeply entrenched core value of, of Antora um, to make everyone feel um, seen and, and heard and respected and, and really appreciated um, on a regular basis. Um, so that's, yeah, kind of the second aspect to, to just the, the hiring part um, that, okay. yeah, I think is pretty critical for, for startups, especially. 100%. And and I, I like your kind of culture building as well as your outreach comments. And this is this is a good transition to this last question before we go to the Q&A um, from the audience. And Annie, I want, I want to start with you first, because obviously you have the experience. Maybe you've answered this question before. It's sometimes a taboo topic, but I'm sure many of our audience is, is interested. Compensation. Um, how, how do you how would how do you describe to prospective uh, entrants into this field um, in in, into into this uh, job market space, um, how do you, how do you work with them in, in getting them to understand kind of uh, what compensation looks like, what compensation levels would look like? Obviously, we do, numbers will vary from from role to role to role, company to company to company. But how how do how do you kind of have that conversation? Yeah, I think I'm pretty lucky that uh, Antora has has excellent leaders that have uh, gone and secured you know, a Series B run of fund, fund, funding for us that'll. Uh, keep our uh, runway pretty pretty clear for the next few years. So um, I don't have to be super stingy about what I'm offering to folks. Um, we really do pay competitively. Um, and, and that's also relative to the Bay Area, which is uh, honestly saying a lot. Um, so our, our focus uh, really from the beginning is to build like the absolute best team, um, both that's in, at a technical capacity and a cultural capacity. And, and a lot of that is, you know, part of that is making sure that we can pay uh, people to relocate here and live comfortably and live to the you know standard of living that, that they want. Um, so I, I really didn't have any personal issues moving from Arizona space to, to here um, or, or, you know, offering uh, a lot of my um, new hires salary. Uh, we do also have a, a pretty big equity upside um, for at least for Antora's business model, which I also like to discuss. It's not always like the, the clearest or, you know, as, as clean cut as, as salary, which is, a, you know, a lump sum of, of cash per year. But um, Antora uh, has this really big opportunity and um, tapping into this like one trillion global annual market for, for fossil fuels in the industrial sector. Um, that's, you know, our, our total addressable market is, is really huge. So um, at, at a startup, especially one that's as early stage as ours, you get a big chunk of equity as part of your total compensation package. And, and for us, that's um, a really huge opportunity to, to grow over the next, you know, many decades. Um, so that's something that I like to discuss with, you know, um, prospective employees as well. Okay. I think the equity piece is something that everyone needs to understand. And maybe, um, uh, maybe I'll, I'll go to Duncan next and then Mazer. Um, maybe, maybe kind of uh, elaborate on kind of Annie's, Annie's comments, talk a little bit about compensation and how you communicate it with, with perspective of uh, entrance into the, into the space. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, uh, in terms of compensation, I mean, uh, as a as a as a startup, or like many other startups, we we don't necessarily uh, you know, pay the highest rates. Uh, we we do pay a top of market, especially for Kenya. Um, but in if you compare, if you're gonna get a job at maybe McKinsey, it, it wouldn't be the same amount. But how we compensate for that? is uh, we have a pretty generous ESOP as well. Um, so we offer everyone at Octavia uh, employee share options, and that's for everyone to be invested in the business and the success of the business. And uh, generally the promise that we make to all the folks that we hire is that, you know, as the business grows, so will your, um, so will your total compensation, you know, the, the annual salary that you get. Um, but also um, as the business becomes successful, that's how you can actually build that generational wealth uh, because at some point the business will have an exit. And this is something that, uh, Everyone at Octavia has, um, right from the engineers all the way to the uh, manufacturing and shop floor workers, all the way to the cleaners. Everyone who works at Octavia has equity in the business, and it's uh, pretty generous. Okay, hopefully that uh, kind of addresses some of the the questions around around how equity works. Mazar, is there anything you would like to add to that? 
Uh, yeah, so when it compare when it when it comes to us in India, so we start the process in a similar manner. So so it depends for us. It depends in the phases. So when when we are started, when we are in the very early stage of an organization, we we get talent by giving comparative pay scales. What you see in India with ESOP options. Once we raise uh, enough. Uh, uh, funding for our organization once you reach series A, series B. That is when we will be going a little bit ahead of our competition, which is there in the market, whether it is an established MNC or any other established startup, because that is when we will be really looking into getting a bit experienced uh, folks into the organization with, with what are the existing talent that you have. So that's how we generally do this. Apart for, for apart from this, for the new hires, we generally get associated and do a lot of, uh, 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 say, sponsorship uh, to the uh, uh, events that that happen with respect to the student community. Whether it is formula student events, whether it is Baha India events, we are an official sponsor for these events. Whether it is Shell Eco Marathon such events. So we generally look for the right talent who are invested in such domain and we do a lot of campus uh, hiring or the placement from the event itself. Okay. Melissa, how about you? I think my response would be similar to what Annie said. We're fairly competitive um, and also we have sharing options. So I think I echo what the, most of the panels already said, but um, definitely okay. the reward, reward makes it much more worthwhile. So. There is that bonus. I think our conversation so far has been very fruitful. I think it's been very valuable for for all of the all of the audience. Um, in fact, we have many questions already. For those of you uh, in the audience who would like to still ask a question, please use the Q and A button. Um, I, I know some of you might be using the chat feature, um, but we'd prefer if you can use the Q and A button uh, to uh, to ask your question. Um, but we have a number of questions already, and uh, and I'm going to try and get to as many as we can in the short period of time that we have left. Um, to the panelists, I encourage you to just jump in if you have if you have uh, if you'd like to respond. Um, but I, I'd, I'm happy also to call upon you. One of the first questions that's getting a lot of interest is this need to upskill mechanical engineers who are in non-climate roles, such that they're contributing to a sustainable future. Do do any of you have any uh, recommendations on how they can upskill so that they are reducing the environmental impacts either of the products that they develop or the processes that they're managing? Um, maybe Duncan, I'll start with you. Yeah. Um, so in, in terms of upskilling, I I, I feel that uh, the the level or or at least the scale of the problem that we're solving. Uh, needs different types of skills, and a lot of those skills tend to be transferable. Uh, for example, in uh, in uh, our system, uh, or at least in the the type of machines that we build, uh, folks who have a lot of experience in HVAC can easily fit in and, and apply those skills here. And so, a lot of that upskilling just happens on the job because those skills are transferable. Uh, so once you just get dive into the deep end, you can essentially um, learn uh, learn on the job, uh, and that's what uh, and goes for. All these other aspects, you know, um, heat transfer. Um, if you have skills in that, you can probably apply them in most um, uh, uh, climate tech solutions. Mazar, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, uh, so, see, the fundamentals are still the same. So, I don't think so. Something changes whether you are not in a climate tech uh, uh, a product uh, organization or you're in, in any other organization. Uh, the only thing that uh, changes is being a mechanical engineer, you will be associated with certain uh, fundamentals of physics. So once you go to this climate tech organization, there are other fundamentals of physics which has to be tied with your basics, what you learned over your uh, academics. Right? So that is a missing block that would be there. So once you try understanding how to connect these blocks, what areas has to be concentrated, uh, that is when you will be able to uh, see, thermal problem is a thermals, but only thing is the physics behind an electric machine is different and a battery pack is different. So, so the fundamental is still the same. Uh, but once you understand how to connect this fundamental, I think that is that 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 remains the same and that will help you to have the transition happening from any other uh, sector to climate tech sector. Azar, I want you to answer this question uh, first, and then and then I think I might go to Annie and Melissa as well. This is a very interesting question. 
Um, this attendee, uh, relatively experienced in mechanical engineers, uh, engineering, um, he identifies uh, his his intent internal metric to identify solutions that can do the most good, and then divide them by the number of people working on them. That's a very mathematical and engineering way of approaching it. I, I love it. Um, but he's saying that he it, it tends to lead when he does that. It tends to lead him away from energy and transportation areas because they're generally more mature and he, he feels like they may not make as much of a difference compared to say the nature-based solutions. Um, how, how do you think he can kind of reconcile that piece and do either of you, uh, we'll start with Mazur, do you have any, any perspective on how he can view um, that, that contrast between energy and transportation and nature-based solutions? Uh, see, uh, what would I uh, say is that uh, uh, transportation solutions are heavily dependent on the energy sector you are in, right? Whether it is an ice sector or EV sector or even hydrogen based sector, it is the energy sector that is going to govern your transportation. So we were in the eras of initially when it was more into uh, uh, internal combustions on different uh, fuels. The fossil fuels came as is not fossil. You different uh, combination of uh, fuels that has come into the uh, come into picture. So that was an inspiration from say your nature based solution, but still that was connected back to your energy sector and the output is your transportation mobility solution. So so ev everything is connected back, right? So, so once once you do in this energy transition from an internal combustion to EV or hydrogen, it is again uh, inspired from any general uh, natural uh, solution, which has again been translated to energy and then energy to a transportation mobility solution. So, uh, so it is it is linked. It's not that it is very different. Uh, you always draw inspirations uh, to your uh, technology roadmaps in any organization from such things. So, so I don't think so. There is a, a difference. Uh, how I see this. Okay, fair enough. Um, this next question, I think everyone can answer. I'm going to try and get a multiple perspectives, but I'm start with Melissa. Um, this idea of eco anxiety, um, and and kind of the the the, the idea that that uh, we're 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 responding emotionally, for lack of a better word, to, uh, to, to the challenge of climate change or the problem of climate change. How have you or your team transformed that into actions? What have you seen? Um, I think the natural transformation is just inspiration. Um, and I think it helps drive your teams forward, right? You're very inspired to solve these problems. And um, maybe if you harness that emotion and it helps you drive forward and maybe not feel defeated, but feel inspired instead of uh, feeling that anxiety. It really helps our team. And I think it would be really applicable to anybody who's interested. 100%. Annie, how about you? Yeah, I agree with Melissa, just you know, turning that um, anxiety more into being energized and, and excited to approach a challenge. I think I would personally feel more anxiety if I wasn't working on uh, climate change. And at this point, at least I can say that, you know, I've, I've spent, uh, you know, done, done the best that I can to help tackle the problem. Um, yeah, it, it is difficult and it's easy to kind of get lost in um, the like existential, really high level crises. And, and that's, you know, fair to feel and that's very human and, and reasonable, but um, try not to get too, too lost in that to the point of inaction. Um, so otherwise, you know, <laughs> what, 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 what's the point? Um, yeah, yeah I, I don't know if I have much more to add beyond what Melissa nope, said. Enough. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, this next question is very interesting. I don't think this is so much a, uh, a climate or climate tech specific question, but I think for the mechanical engineering audience, I think it's 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 useful just to hear it again, maybe if they haven't if they've heard it before. I'm going to start with Duncan on this one. How do you break down big problems? Do you have any particular strategies around that? Oh yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so basically, what what we essentially do at Octavia, uh, and it's something we've recently implemented and it's working relatively well, is um, 
Okay, the first part is obviously you start with your hy hypothesis for what will work. Um, and then you, you see, uh, and I'll give an example with the dark processor uh, to make it more practical. Um, we, we know for us to effectively capture CO2 from the air, we need to transfer heat uh, to our material to regenerate it. We need to have vacuums uh, and we need to have air mass transfer between uh, the air and the CO2 uh, and the solvent or the material that captures CO2. So having that as a working hypothesis for what will work, we can then break this down into those three aspects and actually experiment on them on different designs that will actually work for each one of them. Uh, and some of them work most of the time, they don't. Uh, and then you, you but the, the ones that don't always lead you to what works. Uh, and just by breaking it down into those uh, smaller chunks, you can essentially, and experimenting on them, you can, uh, you can, um, you, you don't have to think about the whole problem as a whole. And then the, the second piece is uh, also still on, on that uh, breaking down the problem is on doing um, pre-mortems uh, or, or risk analysis. Uh, and so you have your hypothesis for what works and in each of these steps uh, or in each of these things that you need to achieve, uh, actually asking yourself if if we are look, looking at this project two months down the line after we've implemented everything and it failed catastrophically, why did it fail? And we actually usually do that on Excel, very simple. And you have different people uh, applying or at least giving their own insights into this. And then that allows you to see where the risks are and then you can meet, uh, develop mitigation strategies against those risks. Uh, and that's how we essentially um, at least iterate really quickly at a smaller scale before we scale up for uh, for manufacturing uh, in the larger modules. Wonderful. Um, we are at time or close to time, I should say. So I wanna wrap up with this final question. I'm gonna go around the room uh, to each panelist. Um, and, and I think this is a good closing off question. Um, the question is specifically, any tips for navigating the job search process in 2024 as a mechanical engineer? I'm gonna amend that question a little bit and say, any tips for navigating the job search process as a mechanical engineer looking to join the climate tech space? And I'm gonna go around my screen and I start, I see Mazar first, so I'll, I'll let you answer first. Yeah, so uh, if I'm a uh, fresh graduate, uh, fresh undergrad from a uh, uh, university, so how would I start looking for a job is to basically uh, look into different climate uh, VCs who are actually funding good uh, startups, go through their portfolio companies, understand uh, which companies are doing what kind of work, understand what kind of openings are they, narrow down your personal interest in which you would like to uh, uh, excel, in which you would like to pursue as a career, and then narrow down those options and then start applying for it. Great. Duncan? Yeah, uh, I would say at, at least have a good understanding of the things that you enjoy uh, within mechanical engineering because it's so broad. Um, and then uh, see the, the business models of different companies. And uh, actually a lot of what I do during uh, when I'm hiring folks is uh, sort of t allowing them to turn the interview around and they also do their own due diligence on us, so, you know, asking us uh, what we do, uh, what the nature of the job is so that you can filter out um, the things that, or at least the, they can filter out the jobs that they, uh, or if it does not suit their interests. So definitely start from a point of the things that you enjoy, whether it's the thermodynamic aspects of mechanical engineering, manufacturing, structural uh, engineering, uh, et cetera. Okay, Melissa, 10 seconds, one item, one piece of advice. I would say just um, feel reassured from spending time with us all today that your skills are all applicable and find something that inspires you and go after it. Wonderful, and Annie? Uh, same with Melissa, just jump into it. I think now is a fantastic time. If, I think if I tried to look for a job in climate tech, maybe, you know, five, 10 years ago, the space would have been a lot more nascent and maybe all organized. But at this point, stuff is well organized. It's well funded. People are, you know, going after really interesting solutions, really interesting problems. And uh, it's, it's a fantastic time. Um, you know, tons of resources out there. So just, just kind of get into it and get going. That's great. I think that was all great advice. Thank you to all four of you for participating in this panelist uh, session. Uh, thank you to ASME Engineering for Change and Climate Draft for their support. Thank you to the audience. I hope this was incredibly useful and, 
and valuable. And uh, don't forget to continue to making the connections, learning more, and hopefully one day we'll see you in the climate space. Have a great day, everyone.